and welcome to In Practopia, that people, places, things, Caribbean podcast. My name is Kim Zhe. Well, after a nine-year hiatus, In Practopia is back with a new season of pulsating conversations with experts who are doing well to continuously develop the Caribbean in a positive way. You can find our old episodes at www.inpractopia.com and also on YouTube. I invite you to stay until the end. Please like this episode, share it, send us feedback at letstalkatinpractopia.com. If you would like to make a suggestion, if you have a guest, if you would like to be a guest, we welcome all of that. This all new episode of Inpractopia is all about the organization of Eastern Caribbean states OECS, which by the way, it celebrates 43 years of existence this month, June 2024. We start off with, do you know, five facts about the OECS, followed by my chat with Dr. Didicus Jules, Director General of the OECS, followed by Ode to the Caribbean quote, and we end with the announcement of next week's guest. Now, let's get the show on the road. Do you know five facts about the OECS? One, the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States came into being on June 18, 1981, when seven Eastern Caribbean countries signed the Treaty of Basté in St. Kitts, agreeing to cooperate with each other and promote unity among the members. Two, the 1981 treaty was replaced on June 18, 2010, with the revised Treaty of Basté, creating an economic union, known now as the Eastern Caribbean Economic Union, or OECS Economic Union. Three, the OECS is an 11-member grouping of islands spread across the Eastern Caribbean, made up of seven protocol members that enjoy full membership, Antigua and Barbuda, the Commonwealth of Dominica, Grenada, Montserrat, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and also four associate members, Anguilla, the British Virgin Islands, Martinique, and Guadeloupe, who are treated as full members for many of the organization's activities. Four, all citizens of the seven OECS protocol member states are entitled to indefinite stay access to jobs and social services within the economic union. And five, the OECS Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, ECCU, is one of only four monetary unions in the world. All this and more is available at new.oecs.int. We will post links in our show descriptions on the website and everywhere podcasts are available. And now, without further ado, my conversation with Dr. Didicus Jules, Director General of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, OECS. Well, the OECS is a group in uh, 11 member states. And if you look at the map of the Caribbean, the chain of islands, um, starting from the British Virgin Islands in the north, in Anguilla, right, all the way down to the middle and the southernmost point. Um, excluded from that chain is Barbados, who has expressed interest from time to time in being a member of the OECS and has had a long history of collaboration and association with us. And uh, the Dutch speaking islands. The French countries recently came on board. So we have Martinique and Guadeloupe. And uh, the third French member is due to join by November or December. That is Saint Martin. On the, on the French side of St. Martin. So this constitutes the OECS. And um, there's a long history to that because you recall that when the West Indies Federation was, was established, shortly afterwards, there was a breakup of the Federation um, and that led to the independence of Jamaica followed in short order by Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, et cetera. And so after this in 1966, penned a, a, a book called The Agony of the Eight, where he looks at eight of the smaller islands of the West Indies. 
and argued from both a political and, a, and an economic perspective that smallness was really a limiting factor for development and that a collective arrangement, even in looking at the public service in these countries, that the aggregation of scale would make more sense. So for example, Sir Arthur argued that certain public services could be aggregated, like have a sing single police force, a single public administration, in order to more effectively manage those things. And so coming out of the, in, in many respects, one can consider Sir Arthur is to be the intellectual author of the OECS. And coming out of that, there were several attempts, like there was the West Indies Associated States Council of Ministers, WISER, which was established in 1966 itself, that came directly out of Sir Arthur's Agony of the Eight. And then WISER moved to the Eastern Caribbean Common Market that was established in 1968, so from 66 to 68. Um, but the, the, the OECS itself as a construct was formally established in 1981 when the Treaty of Basta was signed and it replaced WISER and eventually in 1997 it replaced the idea of the Eastern Caribbean Common Market. So the original treaty placed a very strong emphasis on political, economic, and social objectives that could be achieved collectively. Um, and then it was replaced by the revised treaty of Barca, which now spoke in a more wholesome sense mm -hmm. of migration. I've often explained to people internationally who ask, well, what really is the OECS? I say the simplest way of thinking about the OECS is think of us as a mini European Union. Mm -hmm. because freedom of movement, free movement of people, goods, services, capital, um, ease of doing business, etc. So think of us as a mini EU sans, sans Brexit, without Brexit, because we have no Brexit, thankfully, so far. <laughs> I think that would not be a good thing based on what you said over all of these years. And uh, so Arthur Lewis being, according to you, somebody who formally kind of got all of this going. And I think a Brexit would not be a good solution for us. But it seems like, and for me, knowing somebody, knowing you personally and the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States and wanting to know what kind of achievements we, the OECS um, has accomplished since 1981, and, it's, and we've had so many more islands coming on board. Why do you think that is? Well, I think that the people have recognized that, let's put it this way, in, in, in the Caribbean, we have many things that unite us, but we also have many things that divide us. And unfortunately, too often, and historically, we have tended to focus on the things that divide us rather than the things that unite us. And so this accounts for some of the dissonance. Um, from the time of the breakup of the Federation, there has always been this trajectory by the bigger countries to go it alone. I recall um, that when Trinidad had the oil boom, they were on a trajectory of their own. They did provide a lot of assistance to the rest of CARICOM. Um, Guyana, with all of its resources for a while, ex experienced a lot of difficulty. Now that Guyana is experiencing the oil boom, they are playing a role in helping to strengthen the CARICOM effort tremendously. Um, but the reality is that in many of the small states, the, the peculiarity of size imposes some real constraints. Um, there was a in the 60s, I believe, really, by a guy called Schumacher that said, small is beautiful. Now, small may be beautiful, but it's also very painful because um, the economies of scale and the cost of doing things is so much exponentially higher on the per unit cost. I mean, if you think of climate change, for example, mm -hmm. seawall defenses and all of the infrastructure that needs to be built is to a level of resilience to withstand those storms. In a place like, say, Monstrat with a population of 4,000 people is a huge per capita cost. Um, and it, in fact, on a per capita basis, if you amortize it, it is so much more expensive than, say, for the United States on a per capita mm -hmm. to address those challenges. 
And I think that's what a lot of people don't get, especially in the discussions on financing for climate change, because they just see like, oh, these small countries, these SIGs, small island developing states are asking for so much, but we are the most vulnerable and we are the ones who suffer most from the effects of the polluters. But yet we get very little and the cost of our resilience is going to be much higher to us. And the penalty for not doing it is going to be fatal because I'm sure you've seen the projections yeah. that the Pacific Islands will disappear. Even New York City itself yeah. is gradually going underwater. I, I worry about that quite a bit, and which is why I'm really trying to get Impractopia back on board so we can have those discussions and people all over can be sensitized a little more because our islands, like you said, we're the ones who are the most vulnerable to everything that more developed countries are doing. And with a few more inches of sea level rising, uh, hurricanes becoming more forceful, we could be wiped out like that. And when we talk about forced migration and all of the issues worldwide that's happening right now with migration, that's going to affect us uh, in, in, in a huge way. Right. And I've yeah, and I've seen some of the things that the OCS is trying to to get on board to tackle these these problems that are so real. Should log on to our website www.oecs.island2. And when you log on, you can sign up to get fortnightly updates. So you see what we're doing in all spheres. But the issue of climate change is really is not a is not a rhetorical statement to say that it is an existential threat to us. Um, and what people don't get with the with the question of scale is there's a certain insensitivity globally, an insensitivity of the heart and sympathy, you know, to be mm -hmm. sense. When you heard that in Dominica, I think in the early stages of Hurricane Maria, there was something like 27 deaths in the first lash of the hurricane. Mm -hmm. you living in Tokyo or in New York, it's uh, 27 people dead. That's not even a train crash in New York City. So, but what they don't get is that 27 people dying in a population of what 50,000. When you scale that up, if that were Tokyo, it would be about 20 million people die, dying in, in that, by that same catastrophe. Yeah. So in the context of scale, then you realize that you know human sympathy has to adjust itself to that reality of scale and size. Yeah, you, you're, so, you're so right. And um, in the work that you're doing, among the islands themselves, what is the level of sensitivity among the population or how do they see the organization working uh, on the ground in the countries? Well, the reality of today's world is that we live in a time of great, well, what has been described as Buka time, volatile, uncertain, tumultuous times. So crisis is the nature of the game. And, um, one of the approaches that we have taken in the OECS to all this concatenation of crises that we face from climate change to, you know, um, disasters, hurricane, volcano, it's one thing after the next plus the cost of um, with the war in Ukraine, the escalating price of food and everything. Mm -hmm. it's, it's one thing after the next. And in fact, some of these waves don't come successively. They come in all at the same time. So it's a real challenge for us. And um, one of the perspectives that we keep foremost in our mind in, in trying to address these issues, and that's something I constantly remind the team at the OECS about, is that if you take a crisis or problem and you turn it upside down and inside out, rather than look to put a plaster on the problem, mm -hmm. which is the right thing people try to, okay, let's recover from a disaster, let's just solve that problem. If you turn it upside down and inside out and you look for a deep-seated solution, not a plaster for the soil, but a cure, then inevitably the solution that you come up with will take you somewhere further, better than you would have gone had that problem not occurred in the first place. Right. So mm -hmm. this is the approach. This is the core of our approach to doing business at the OECS. And for example, at the time, I can give you several examples of that. When we had Hurricane 
when we saw the predictions of the hurricane season, the year that Irma and Maria occurred, we said, let's look at some scenario planning. What if none of the Caribbean islands were hit by any of these storms because it was predicted to be a year of, period of unprecedented storm activity? What if none of us was hit, but Miami was devastated? We would still be devastated in the sense that our supply chain largely comes mm -hmm. from so everything would cease in terms of supplies. Are we able to feed ourselves? Are we able to keep things going? Big question now. What if a couple of the OECS islands were hit and a large country like Haiti with all of its challenges were hit? The capacity of the CARICOM mechanism to respond to that, so DEMA and the other agencies responsible for disaster response, would be really swamped by the scale of human suffering in these wider demographics. So which meant that we would not be, while they would make every effort to assist us, that we would not, the priority would not be on us. So it meant therefore that in our scenario planning, we had to look at a scenario as if we existed in a bubble mm -hmm. numbers, and ask, regardless of what scenario manifested, how would we survive and manage on even build back better from that. And that was why when Uma, when Uma first hit, we were able to respond instantly to those. Within a day, we were, we were in the BVI, we, were, we had visited Antigua. We, didn't, we were not able to get on the ground in, in, in um, Barbuda, but mm -hmm. we were where the government was making every effort. They had already relocated the population and everything and we visited the BVI. So we were able, we had, with the assistance of Venezuela, two C-130 Hercules aircraft with 20 tons of supplies ready to go in the event of a hurricane. We had two helicopters available to us for search and rescue. So, and then importantly, the agreement was that because these northern countries had been hit so badly, that the Windward Islands, the southern part of the OECS, which is by the way, more of the breadbasket countries because of their soil type and agriculture being a mainstay of their economies, would be responsible for providing food stuff and water because in Dominica and San Lucia, we have water producing facilities so that we supply to them. And so the, the and then within weeks or a couple of weeks, we had Maria hit and that do, hit, knocked Dominica out of the supply yeah. chain. So again, we had to quickly adjust and in fact, what we did was to move things forward by getting Dominica back on track, um, even in the midst, even before they were able to fully clear all the debris. We, for example, had a project with the Ministry of Agriculture in Dominica to seed, um, to create 300,000 seedlings of high value nutritious, nutritionist um, produce that could take about three to six weeks to, 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 to provide yield. So things like kale, tomatoes, and so on. And these were just distributed on the street to whoever wanted them. So even if your whole plantation, your whole farm was destroyed, in between the fallen trees and so on, plant whatever you can, at least as an interim measure. So within six weeks, the markets in Dominica were flourishing again with local produce. And you know Caribbean people can't survive on canned food for long. No. The Dominica had made an arrangement with supermarkets in Barbados to supply canned foodstuffs and other essential items to the population. And that worked well, but it was important to get the real value nutritional stuff back into place. I'm yeah. so glad you said that uh, because I wonder being so far away and I can't always uh, keep abreast of what's happening when things happen in, in, my, in my birth region. So food and how we are able to respond quickly in disasters was something that was on the top of my list. And I'm so glad you touched on that, that there is some mechanism to respond and that we are able to help our neighbors when there is disaster because food like water is vital for survival. Yeah, yeah. Now, even though on the water point, remember St. Vincent had this volcanic eruption. Mm -hmm. the, the northern side of the island was evacuated to the south. And then while that if after that evacuation happened, we had floods in the south. So mm -hmm. evacuated the north, floods in the south. 
And of course, that created all the health problems. What we were we able to do? We were able to work with the government of St. Vincent to develop what we call a, 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 a school in a, in a cell phone, right? Uh -huh. so our cell, um, we developed because the problem is that imagine the scenario volcanic eruption, school is totally disrupted. You have about over 10,000 students on the to continue their schooling. Government provided immediate housing for them, temporary schools. <clears throat> but again, with the whole of the disruption, every the average penetration of cell phones in the OECS is two point something per, per pop in, within the population per head. So it meant that on average, most people have two cell phones. Yeah. So when the kids have cell phones. So the easier way, rather than look at just, um, because if you're talking laptops and you're talking about electrical supplies for them, internet and all of that, the cell was the one thing that was in the context of the volcanic eruption was alive and working. Mm -hmm. So got their lessons on the cell phone. And they, they responded, they sent their lessons there. Their homework on that, the teachers gave assignments and so on. Um, water became a problem for Dominic, for St. Vincent. So we started bringing in water. Of course, a lot of donations coming in and people sending in. Dominica had, in the space of two months, more plastic waste coming into Dominica as a result of the influx of water, bottled water in plastic containers than it had, had in the entire year previous. A solution suddenly now becomes a problem of pollution. What the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines did was to, with some support from us, was to employ persons to do collection of plastic waste linked with a French company that had the possibility of taking that waste to use in more productive ways so that persons who were even farmers who were displaced, even their kids were able to collect the plastic waste and move that into a proper disposal for productive use. Um, the lesson we got coming out of that in future disasters is that we're not going to be encouraging shipment of pallets of plastic bottles. We're now looking at, we're looking at bladders, right? Say that could hold, say, a 500 tank or so equivalent of water. And to badge these into the countries, let that be fed to trucks or you know, other large containers that can then be distributed. So you don't have the same waste of volume of plastic waste being generated as a result of a disaster. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of thinking that I think really works well in the OECS because as you say, necessity is the mother of invention, but that's again, true. every crisis has its opportunity. I think there's a Chinese saying that's a favorite of mine says that crisis is opportunity right in a dangerous way. I'm going to I'm going to copy that one. I, I love sayings and I <laughs> I try to attach um, words of wisdom to everything I try to embark on in my life so that you know it can be productive. But uh, Dr. Jules, it it's it seems that the organ OECS acts as a, a buffer. So do you respond automatically or do you wait for people to come to come to your your for your assistance, or is that tell us a little bit more about how that works in, in the scheme of things? Well, first of all, inter, you need to understand the structure of the OECS. So we mm -hmm. have a, an OECS authority, which is comprised of all of the heads of government of the OECS. Each member state has an OECS commissioner, it's like an ambassador appointed to the OECS, and that serves as a sort of administrative board of directors, if you want to follow that. And the director general of the OECS is the chairperson of that board. So that becomes a filter for matters going to heads. Now, in terms of the engagement of member states, we have an economic council, which comprises all the ministers of economic affairs and so on, or designations by the prime ministers. So that is the second most powerful body in the OECS. It looks at issues relating to the economic union. Some of the issues there are shared in terms of competence with the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank because they handle monetary policy and finance, certain financial matters, right? And then you have the treaty speaks to a council of ministers, but we have interpreted that liberally to mean councils of ministers. So we have constituted 
councils of ministers of education, health, environment, of social um, resilience, social social affairs, social development. Um, we are in the process of constituting ministers of sport because sport has really started to explode in the OECS. I'm sure you've read of the success of their teams. Yes. Um, we also convening ministers of youth and ministers of culture. The ministers of culture, because with our partnership with Africa now, and by the way, parenthetically, five of the seven countries that initially signed on to the partnership with Africa, five of the seven were OECS member states, independent member states. The six independent member states, Grenada, did not sign on at the time because they were in the middle. They were actually in election mode at that point. So, but they've since come on board. So, with these councils of ministers, we are able to look at specific work within the portfolio. So, we, when we, our education ministers, for example, meet as ministers of education at one time, other at certain points, they may meet as ministers of higher education. So, in that case, the agenda looks at social education issues. And they are supported by different com um, counts, different committees that we've established. So there's a there's a committee of permanent secretaries of education, permanent um, chief education officers. Coming out of the experiences of the disasters we've had, for example, so you recall there was a time when dengue was a serious threat in the region. Mm -hmm. Dengue is spread by the mosquitoes. So we not only convene our ministers of health, but realizing the threat of dengue, when the ministers wrap their heads around that together with the chief medical officers, we realize that we need to create another structure. And we brought together all the environmental control officers in the ministries as a, as a grouping to discuss how best to deal with the eradication of the mosquito. Interestingly, the commonly used technique is fogging, but then yeah. the people culture wonders about that because when, when you fog, you also destroy not just the mosquitoes, but the bees, and the bees are critical to the ecosystem of agriculture. So right there, we had to quickly do the research, and we brought in an international firm that was versed in non-fogging techniques for eradication of bees, uh, not bees, sorry, eradication of mosquitoes, and so we were able to find a different solution. But we learned a lot out of every time we do those things, we ask what are the experiences, what are the lessons we need to take to another level in the work that we do. So we, re we recognize then that not only should we have top level people in the ministry come across the member states converging in these committees, but let us also look at bringing it down to other levels. And not just for the sake of bringing it down to other levels, but as the need arises, to bring those people together. So the environmental control officers, when we first brought them together, it was the first time they were even getting to meet their counterparts because um, you know, eradication of, of pests is not something that is the, the subject of regional meetings. So unlike say agricultural extension officers or phytosanitary control people who would meet necessarily because they would cross these boundaries, right? Yeah. So and people who are locked in their insular silos mm -hmm. as a regional brainstorming group. And that showed huge benefits, right? What yeah. we try to do now is to move beyond just them being a, a, a virtual group to sometimes having exchanges. So if there's somebody who has a particular expertise in a particular area, that person can go help another member state in that area of their expertise. And that exchange would happen. So we kind of gradually functioning without actually structurally creating it as a regional public service. Oh, wow. I, I, I'm very, very encouraged by that. And I really want, I, this is going to reach far beyond the region and into the diaspora. And, and that's, that's the intent of this, of this podcast. So that people know more. A lot of times you hear about organizations and people think it's just, oh, you're just meeting and then nothing happens. But when you can actually share and, and you said all of those things, it, it's encouraging. And you know what, Dr. Jules, on a side note, when you were talking about the mosquitoes, I remember growing up when, you remember when people used to talk about police migraine? 
when they yep. would come around and do all of the fogging. And yeah. it, it's great that you, 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 you know something one way and over time, like you said, people start talking, you learn different ways because one thing that might solve a problem might affect something else that ultimately impacts us as well. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Just quickly, as you mentioned the diaspora, I have stuff to share there as well because there is a group of Caribbean people um, who set up in London a database for the diaspora, not just for the London diaspora, but the International Caribbean Diaspora. I think it's called Caribbean Skills Bank. And the idea there is that all expertise in the diaspora can register with that skill bank and make their services available pro bono where they wish, but also be available for consulting work in the Caribbean. And that has, we part, we've actually partnered with them and said, you can have our logo on your site because we really would like to see this become a major directory where persons with all levels of skills who want to give back to the region can do so through that mechanism. I mean, oh, after, uh, yes. We need, sometimes that we need to recruit expertise that may not be available in the region. We routinely share our ads with them and they check their database. And there are persons who have given a lot of pro bono assistance and our thinking there is that where our procurement rules permit, persons who have given pro bono assistance systematically should be given some special consideration in awarding consultancies. And you're using your own people, their own expertise, they know the context, they know the environment, they understand the culture, and they've you know, absorbed the technologies and the knowledge abroad to add value to their region. Yes. Oh, my and God, I love it. We're also trying to do, and that one has been a little more difficult. We've suggested to our heads of government that when they go to major capitals for meetings, like, for example, New York with the UN General Assembly, um, let us try to coordinate the timing of their visits so that aside from the state, you notice on our website, we now have, for the last year, the last couple of UNGs, we have a, 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 a we put up a, a post that gives you access to all of the speeches made by the OECS heads of government at the yes. end. The next stage from that is while they in hopefully when they're physically in, in New York for the UNG at around the same time to schedule a meeting of the OECS diaspora. Now many of most of the virtually all the governments, the heads when they come in. They make time to meet with their diaspora. The St. Lucian Prime Minister meets with the St. Lucians, Grenada meets with the Grenadians, etc. But we would like an opportunity to arise or to create an opportunity where all member heads of government of the OECS have one meeting. They can still have their side meetings with their, their nationals, but one OECS rally where they can speak and bring people up to date on what are the plans. So as we move, for example, to the to the realization of the economic union, I mean, the free movement of the free movement of people is already in place. Yeah. The circulation of of goods, capital, and all of that, that people are appraised of that. So, for example, with the economic union, if you start a business in Geneva, you don't have to register. It. You will, should not have to register it in any other part of the OECS. Registration in one part is registration in all. You want to transfer goods from a business in St. Kitts to a new business you're setting up in Antigua. You've already paid tax for the goods to come into St. Kitts. It could be transferred to your Antigua operation. No additional taxes paid. So these are the, the these are the practicalities. Uh, we've also suggested to governments that we look at how we can engage the diaspora also in terms of investing back at home. Now, Existing instruments are government bonds. Some people in the diaspora do use that mechanism. But we want to go deeper. In every foreign investment, why not reserve, say, 30% of that for investment by nationals of the OECS? And by nationals, we're not just talking about the rich people being able to invest. You have, I think, the last count I heard was about 20 billion EC dollars across the OECS in credit union savings. Yeah. And that in foreign banks earning what three percent um being used for consumer loans at five, six percent. Now that 
cash sitting there could be a very powerful vehicle for building the countries, building our economies, using our own bootstraps. So if we reserve that, then a, mute, a credit union could set up a mutual fund. And people, at the, you know, even if it's $10 a month, you can afford as a farmer or, or a domestic worker or hotel worker, you can, you can have a share of, or part of a share in, an, in a hotel or some big investment in the country. But yeah. It's a culture of shareholding. I, I love that. And that's something I have on my list to explore more uh, as something in the region. I Just living in the, in the U.S., it's opened my mind to a lot of things that can be transferred and maybe done a lot easier in, in the region. And I'm so glad that you mentioned that. It's just a matter of sharing that and getting people to understand how the little that they can put in can re can can they can reap so much more down the line. What are a couple of things that the OECS is focused in right now um, that's top of your agenda? Well, then we, we've identified several priorities for the, this triennium. And the foremost of it is accelerating regional integration, because especially with what is happening what I describe as this concatenation of crises and plus the geopolitical instability that we see and the consequences of that for us as SIDS, um, accelerating regional integration is crucial. The reinvent associated with that is the reinvention of the economy. It is also important to look at inclusion um, and, and equity. So all of these priorities are being brought together. They all converge in some ways, they overlap. And um, this is going to be our, our singular focus in, in this three or two years. Oh, I love it. And and I, I know you as somebody who, I have always admired your wisdom. And I will tell you one thing really quick that well, years ago when we had a workshop in the ministry, I said, apart from loving my parents, if I could choose two people, Oprah would be my mother and you would be my father. And mostly for you because of your vision and just the, the effort that you put in every day to make whatever you do successful and the people around you and the countries that you devote your time to so that they can be successful. And I wanted to say that to you publicly. Um, I appreciate that. But one of the things that um, there are a couple of sayings that guide me in what I do. And one of them is from an Italian philosopher called Gramsci, who says that we must maintain an optimism of the will despite the pessimism of the intellect. So it means no matter how bleak things appear or how down things may be, we can't give up. Wow. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. There is so much to learn, and once you get that opportunity to be able to share the knowledge that you've gained, it's so impactful. So, like Dr. Jewel said, I hope you've come away with one or two things that will cause you to take some action. Like, one, subscribing to the OACS newsletter on their website and volunteering your services, because small island developing states always welcome the help that will afford them to be able to deal with the challenges that they face as small countries and to be able to do more for their citizenry. And now, our ode to quote comes from Dr. Didicus Jules, who addressed the opening ceremony of the 36th OECS Policy Board meeting and the 9th OECS Council of Ministers in October 2023, where he says, Ultimately, our efforts at regional integration should lead to the association of the Eastern Caribbean as a family, pooling our strengths, facing challenges together, and leaving no one behind. The rotation of these meetings provides an opportunity to sensitize the public of our work in vital areas that are making a difference in their lives. Health matters. It matters to everyone and the experience of the pandemic has punctuated its centrality to public well-being. Amen to that. Well, that's our show for this week. Next week, my guest is Dr. Jerome T. Singh, historian at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine campus in Trinidad, where our discussion centers around foreign influence on Caribbean youth. I invite you to like, share, Hit that notification button on YouTube. Help Impractopia reach far and wide. 
and come back where I will be right here in Practopia.